Well, there's a tremendous amount going on in the world, and one of our favorite economists, Martin Armstrong, is with us. Well, hello from beautiful British Columbia. It's sort of a gray, hazy day out there, but we're not gray in our hearts. We're pretty excited. Lots of good things are happening in the world. Um, I would say I'm a bit more excited for what's happening in the United States than for what's happening in Canada. I keep kind of checking out some of our news, and I don't know if I'm seeing anything real, you know, newsworthy, exciting, where I can go, okay, this has changed for us. I don't... I'm not really seeing that in Canada, and I hope that we're all going to rise to the occasion, have a few prayers about that, and, and see if we can see the same kind of victory that they just had in the United States of America. It's been epic. But I'm excited about our guest today because we've had him on numerous times in the past, and you all love him. You love Martin Armstrong. You love uh, hearing about his take on upcoming events, and he has a few predictions that he sees trending, and I would call Martin Armstrong a seer, that he is a discerner of the times. Uh, he can tell when, you know, when there's some caution that, that needs to be taken. So before we get to him, let's read from my wonderful father's Bible. I love this treasure that he left me, and it's become so important to me, so important that I now, I'm marking up my own Bible so that I leave it for my children, so that one day when I'm gone, they will know what I thought um, the Lord was speaking and what's important. And I turned today to a rather significant portion of scripture that my dad, it's a bit dark, to be honest. It's not all good news. It's in Luke 13, verse 25. And basically, um, you know, Jesus is giving, Jesus is giving commentary and he's been telling some parables and this is Jesus speaking, and he says this. This is a parable. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Very old English. Isn't that precious? <laughs> So I hope you get the gist. He's saying, I don't know who you are. The master of the house is saying, I hear you knocking, but I don't know you. And then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in, in your presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he, the master of the house, shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. And I'm wondering if one day we're going to be just a little bit surprised at who isn't. Uh, one of the ones who made it and who is. Uh, we think that all of these uh, highfalutin people that love to talk the talk are really the ones that seem, you know, to be saying that they know God's, um, you know, God's plan. But are they really the ones that know their God? Do they know the master? I don't know. And I think we might get to heaven one day and look around and go, well, where's so-and-so? You know, the big, the big world-renowned person. All right. I won't even name them and I won't call them by any sort of ministerial, uh, you know, titles that they might wear. I'm just going to say we might be surprised at who's there and who's not because these people clearly in the word thought that God would know them because they ate and they were there with him and they, they felt that they were doing things for God. And yet he says, you were workers of iniquity. I think that's terrifying, and uh, I pray that I'm never deemed to be a worker of iniquity, but actually someone who tells the truth, and we actually believe here on the show that, I mean, I won't bring people on that I don't think aren't telling the truth and aren't uh, bringing us something that is powerful, 
And my guest today, Martin Armstrong, as I said, I believe that he sees things. He sees, uh, he sees trends and he's able to accurately predict things. Like, listen to this. So he's one of the most famous economic forecasters alive. He's famous or infamous for having predicted the October 1987 Black Monday crash to the very day. He also called the uh, N N Nikkei stock, am I saying that right, JT? Market collapse. So this stock market collapse in 1989 and the Russian financial collapse in 1998. He relies on complex mathematical and historical models rather than economic theory, but he is strongly anti-state and anti-central bank. And we've talked with him plenty of times regarding gold and silver and and the good of uh, making your investments uh, be in the right place. Martin, thank you for waiting there in the background. And we're so happy to have you. Um, thank you for uh, being someone who is willing to tell the truth. And I'm sure that there are prices to be paid for that as you tell the world what's going on. But we are kind of excited and would love to hear your take about what's happened recently in the United States of America and this huge Trump, you know, they're, they're calling it a landslide. And it, mm -hmm. it has seemed to be extremely wonderful for the U.S. But how do you see it? And what do you see some of the difficulties might be ahead? Well, uh, actually, our computer forecasts this against everybody else. I mean, uh, it's been quite phenomenal. I mean, it had produced. It had forecast that uh, Trump would beat Hillary. It forecast uh, Brexit would win. Uh, even Nigel Farage came to our uh, 2019 conference in, in Rome and said, of course, I'm here. He's the only one that said I would win. It, it, our computer looks at the economics of it. Uh, and uh, this was, it was predicting a, a landslide. And the last one was about 52 years ago with Richard Nixon pretty much the same thing when he said we're going to take us out of Vietnam. Um, you know, Trump and RFK are anti-war. That I can assure you. I mean, I have even <clears throat> been to Mar-a-Lago and I've speak, you know, spoken with uh, RFK. Um, and that's why I argued the two of them should be together, <laughs> really. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, the Democrats on this side are in a declining mode. Uh, if you looked at the chart of it, it would be looked like a bear market. Uh, their biggest win was with FDR. And every win since then has been lower highs and the lows are, are deeper. And actually the computer is projecting that uh, the Democratic Party will probably split. Uh, and they just went really way too far. Uh, on this whole woke agenda, it's against the common sense of, of you know, most people really. And, and I don't think they really got that. Uh, but what we're looking at going forward here is that there is going to be big resistance. Um, you know, just even two weeks before, uh, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats, they were saying they were going to have a landslide. Um, and I was getting calls from Washington. Are you sure it's going to be a landslide for Trump? I'm telling you, that's what I see. Um, and <clears throat> the Democrats I saw it are too. <laughs> I just want to say I felt it. I saw it. I saw all those people gathering all the time. And even though the polls were saying whatever, uh, you know, I, I, I really felt that in my spirit and I'm so glad that, that you kind of, um, you know, that, that you understood that it's, it's just a change. It's a turning point for America in some ways. Yes. It's not going to be easy. Um, it, just as you see right now, you had, um, it, what we call the neocons. It, these are people that just always want war. And they've been advocating war ever since World War II. They haven't won a single one. I mean, even Robert McNamara, you can look on YouTube. Before he died, he apologized. He said I, that, you know, he is the one who took us into Vietnam. 
And he said, we were wrong. We thought Russia was involved. It was just a civil war. That's very nice. But, you know, 58,000 Americans died. And how many, you know, you know, well over a million Vietnamese died because they were wrong. Weapons of mass destruction didn't exist. Uh, it, it's always the same thing with these people. Um, and, I, you know, it's hard to, to fathom, but they, you know, you just had uh, them, you know, take, take it to uh, Biden. He's, he's really, him and Camilla, the real problem with them is that they're just pushovers. They do whatever they're told. And he's, you know, we've had basically four years where he said, no, Ukraine can't use long range missiles. Uh, and all of a sudden he says, well, now you can. Uh, and, you know, it, this is serious. I mean, you know, Zelensky is, I've had two employees in Ukraine, one from Kiev and one from, from Donetsk. They refuse to talk to each other. Um, you're dealing with pure hatred there. It's ethnic hatred that's not going to be, you know, um, solved. It's the same thing in the Middle East. This isn't really, neither one of them are really a war over territory. It's an ethnic war. I mean, as simple as that. They just hate each other. Uh, and, you know, Yugoslavia, when it broke up, they were all fighting. And, you know, the, what was the solution? They created different ethnic states. That was it. All right. Um, that's what <clears throat> should have been done with Ukraine. You know, the, the propaganda we hear from the West is, oh, Russia is the aggressor, blah, blah, blah. Well, the West also agreed <clears throat> that they that the Russians in the Donbass um, were attacked. They, there was a massacre of them. And <clears throat> uh, out came the Minsk Agreement, that they were supposed to separate and be allowed to vote. And, you know, the Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, agreed to it and everybody. And then they didn't honor it. And she actually, I don't know if she had too much to drink or what, but she actually admitted uh, <clears throat> to the press that they negotiated in bad faith. They were just, you know, allowing Ukraine to build an army, you know, uh, and bought time to attack Russia. Uh, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. Right. Uh, and it's so just ethnic. Do you, do you see a change then? Because um, uh, it seems that the Republican Party is now being framed. It's like things have kind of switched upside down a little bit. The Dems were always, you know, calling the Republicans the war mongers. Uh, but that is definitely not the case now. It, it seems that, as you say, Trump and RFK, they want peace. They don't want any young American, you know, men to be paying the price for wars that are not our business. So... In essence, this is a very good turn. But as you say, they're not going to make it easy. What are some of the challenges you think that Trump's going to face? What about economically? What what do you forecast coming up for 2025? Um, we're still looking at a recession really going into uh, 2028. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, all roses and an economic boom. Uh, the, the Democrats are protesting their, their, I mean, their groups that are forming, you know, to, to prevent anything that Trump does. And, and I can tell you when Biden entered office, whatever Trump did, they just reversed. The very first day he opened the border. Um, there, I'm in Florida and I can tell you that, you know, I, ha I went to dinner at Mar-a-Lago and that was the first time I would say any head of state actually impressed me. Trump said that he wanted to take the troops out of Afghanistan. He said he was tired of writing letters to their parents. Your son died for what? He said, what are we doing there? They've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? And that's when he actually impressed me. And he set up a team here in Tampa to figure out how to, to exit from Afghanistan. All right. They were working everything out. Biden comes in the office. Oh, because Trump did it. Fire them all and just walked out, left, you know, billions of dollars of equipment there that now they use against us. Uh, I mean, it's it. 
whatever Trump did, they just had to reverse. And I'm afraid it, there's no common sense to any of this. It's just whatever he did, we have to oppose, regardless if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and that look, has been is, the trend. Yeah. Th this is the problem in all countries, yours as well. All right. That democracy is supposed to be that you're running for the 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 country all right it's not when one side gets in it's now our turn to, to punish the other side um you know it it's it's just wrong i mean this is how countries fall uh even if you look at the history of of russia all right lenin aside from being you know communist he was modeling it more in the United States and wanted a confederation that each republic still retained its sovereignty and could exit if they wanted to. All right, Stalin, the, the rumor in Russia is that Stalin killed, poisoned uh, Lenin and his wife, seized power. Lenin did write a letter, do not let him secede me. Uh, and then he consolidated all the power. And, and turned it into the really a dicta dictatorial USSR. Uh, and, you know, whenever you create a centralized government like that, you know, this one size fits all policy, it, it fails. You know, um, it, it, when the best example is Rome, actually, it survived for a thousand years, it was freedom of religion. And they didn't get into the socialistic idea. They let each place, you know, retain its, its, you know, they weren't, you know, people said, oh, they were all pagans, all the hundreds of gods. That's not exactly true. What it is, is that they allowed each place to keep their gods. <laughs> it's not that the Romans in Rome per se, you know, um, worshiped every one of these gods. That, that didn't really happen, but, um, they just, they allowed everybody freedom. And so it was economically- Which freedom is beneficial. actually God's idea. And you know, that's, that's I think why we have embraced Judeo-Christian values is the freedom mm -hmm. is God's idea, not forcing somebody to believe the way that you do. I mean, Jesus himself never forced one person to follow him, to believe in him or anything. Right. He just presented it. He said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. And, and uh, you know, if you come to me, you know, I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. But um, so, so countries that embrace this, you would think that that's sort of the wonderful thing that they would actually, you know, ha have growth. But there's always those that are fighting that. For some reason, there's always those ones that want power and control. Yes. I mean, um, like Rome started to decline because as the barbarians came in, they blame the Christians. Oh, well, the gods are mad at us because they won't, you know, and, and, and that's where the, you know, the later uh, third century Christian persecutions came in. Uh, it, it's, you know, they always have to blame somebody else, you know, uh, like climate right. change. Oh, it's, the, it's the drive people driving their SUVs or farmers, you know. You know, um, uh, speaking of climate change, I, I'd love to play this clip of our Canadian prime minister. You mentioned Canada a few minutes ago. Um, this is Trudeau at the G20 summit in Brazil saying that we need to worry more about climate change than feeding our kids. Take a look. The challenge we're facing right now is that the direct pressures on individuals and households, the affordability crisis, uh, the being kicked in the teeth by inflation around the world over the past few years, uh, the concerns around the rapid pace of change, the instabilities we're seeing, the shifting geopolitics, the disruptions of the supply chain, have a lot of individual citizens, voters, families, really worried that they're not able to make ends meet. And it's really, really easy when you're in a short-term survive, I gotta be able to pay the rent this month, I gotta be able to buy groceries for my kids, to say, okay, let's put climate change as a slightly lower priority. And that's something that's instinctive. When the storm comes, you wanna hunker down and just sort of huddle up and wait for it to blow over. We can't do that. No, no, let's make sure climate change is our top agenda. What do you think about um, 
you know, what we're dealing with up here in Canada, as opposed to the way America seems to have a bit of a break right now where things could potentially change, um, even though, you know, recession, uh, Trump's going to have to deal with some difficult things um, in that regard. But do you ever kind of put your eye on Canada and wonder what's going on up here? Yeah, I mean, you will also split more or less east versus west. Uh, just what he said there. Oh, you know, you know, all the inflation, inflation started because they put sanctions on Russia. All right. <clears throat> that drove energy prices up. Uh, the supply chain, they caused it with with the lockdowns and COVID. Uh, I mean, these are not things that would have happened if government had, you know, just simply stayed out of the out of the mix. But um, you know, look, I have said before, I had information and I, I warned clients that even Klaus Schwab was telling people two months in advance that a virus was coming. This was all orchestrated. I mean, it, it's, you have to understand this stuff. Um, <clears throat> there are people that think that they know how to run the world and we should do it, uh, and this is what this is all about. Uh, it's the same thing in the Middle East where you do have a lot of um, people deliberately trying to create, um, you know, Armageddon. You know, it's um, and from all sides, you know. It's, yeah, you said you called it trying to create biblical prophecies, like to bring about these biblical prophecies. You think there's some people in the world that are kind of hell bent on bringing about the end. Yeah, I mean, the real question is, if it's deliberately created, is it real? I don't know. Um, we, we have to, to, to find that out. I mean, you know, some people are talking about the, the Fatima prophecies, and that's why they're after Russia all the time. I mean, mm. I, I don't know. I mean, it, you can't always get into somebody else's head as to why are you doing this. It, it, it makes no sense. I mean, as they were, you know, Texas were sending red heifers to, you know, to, uh, to, to Israel for a sacrifice. I mean, you know, can you really make these things happen? Or is it, you know, just uh, an interference sort of way? Do it's you, hard to say. Right. Do, do you think, and, and your <clears throat> computer, I know that you have a computer, you feed lots of information, or somehow it's almost like... Uh, you know, it has a way of, of, of um, you know, seeing the trends and letting us know what's coming. Do you think that there's some reprieve now because of this landslide win that it has been a major kick to the, the woke movement, to the Democrats, uh, Democrats um, ridiculous policies, and in fact, their warmongering. Do you think this has been a reprieve. Will mankind last longer because of this last uh, election? Um, I'm not sure if it will last longer. I mean, because the, the the this all kind of comes to a head by 2032. And, and what the computer's projecting is this form of government that we have with um, republics. We're not really represented. Um, you know, the Democrats didn't represent the people. Does Trudeau really represent? They're trying to impose their vision only. That's a dictatorship. That you know, if you want to be the head of a of a country, you're not supposed to to put in your socialistic ideas. Um, so what we get somebody that uh, is becomes Muslim, and then everybody has to become Muslim in the country. I mean, you can't do this sort of thing. I mean, just look at what Zelensky's done in, to create war. He's outlawed the Russian language. He's told them they're not allowed to have their own religion. They have to convert from Orthodox to uh, Western Christianity. Christmas will now be December 25th. Even the Pope came out against them and said, you can't do this to people. Um, you know, it, it, it's Estonia is trying the same thing, outlawing the speaking, you know, I mean, what if you in Canada could you just outlaw speaking French or America? Well, without outlaw a big speaking war. Spanish? Exactly. I mean, yeah. these are not things you do. 
Um, and, you know, this whole climate change nonsense, I mean, just look at history. We've gone through, you know, uh, the, the sun beats like your heart. Uh, there, you know, it, so are maximum and minimum. I mean, we've had ice ages and warming periods without fossil fuels. Um, it, these things have been going on for a long time. There's a natural cycle to uh, everything. Uh, the climate to life is a cycle. We're born, we live, and we die. Uh, everything has a cycle. There is nothing that doesn't. Uh, a time for everything, as Ecclesiastes says. Yes. A time for war, a time for peace. Exactly. And, and this is unfortunately a time of war because you you have people that I think almost old grievances are coming up because they're losing uh, independence, economics. Uh, Europe will break up because of the same thing. You're trying to dictate over people's uh, culture. Uh, and, you know, one size does not fit all. Uh, I mean, you had uh, Camilla stand up. Somebody questioned, uh, you know, abortion. She says, oh, you're in the wrong, you know, rally. Right. You they know, said Christ is Lord or Jesus is Lord. And she's like, you're in the wrong place. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, how any I mean, Christian can even vote for her. Well, she, I don't think she is. But I mean, yeah. they they tend to think that there is no God and they know best how to do this. Even George Soros. He, there was a 60 minute interview with him. Do you believe in God? No, these people do not believe in God. Uh, they think that it's all random and they have the right to manipulate society to accomplish their end goals. Uh, and that's really what this comes down to. Um, our computers projecting that we're, we're probably going to go back to a direct democracy after 2032. This is not working. Um, we should be asked, shall we go to war with Russia or China, whatever? We're never asked these questions. They just do it. And then we're supposed to show up. And if we don't, we're imprisoned. Yeah, um, you're making a good point. Like the only democracy seems to be we get to vote once every four years or so. Other than that, oh, we don't get a say in anything. Um, no. And, and they get in. And if you have a dictator or if you've got someone who's just willing to open borders and go all crazy, you know, about wokeness and make sure everyone uses their pronouns and make sure that everybody who's in jail that wants to be the opposite sex gets a free operation. I mean, if you want to do that, then, then, then that's given. So what do you think is happening? What did you say? 19, I'm sorry, 2032 would be. Yes. Over the next several years, we're yeah. looking at, um, you know, regional conflicts are coming back. Uh, it's throughout Europe. I mean, it's it's this insane agenda. You had Republicans for Camilla and every one of them, Dick Cheney, his daughter. Um, they were all the neocons who want war. The Republicans weren't going to do it, so they switched sides. Uh, and they go back and forth. Whoever's going to just create war, that's where they're at. Um, yeah, even I, I was I really at shocked at... Uh, Bush's daughter coming out in support of, um, I mean, maybe I wasn't as shocked as I should have been, but I just, I thought, what are you, what is happening? The craziest, most woke person of all time. And, and George Bush's daughter comes out for her. Like we've lost our way in so many, so many different aspects. A lot of the, the younger generations, uh, Hillary Clinton's daughter, I mean, kind of the same thing. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to, to fathom, but they, they have been really kind of brainwashed on a lot of this stuff. And the Western press has been absolutely appalling. I mean, it, it's, what they've done is, it's kind of become the, the Pravda of the USSR. Um, you know, they, they just push their own agenda, um, you know, the New York Times just came out about FEMA and before said, oh, Trump said it's being used for political purposes. Oh, he just made that up. 
it's not true. Now all of a sudden FEMA has come out. They avoid places that had Trump signs. <laughs> you know, oh, um, and that is like so scandalous. I mean, do you, do you think there's going to be consequences to FEMA for, for this coming out? Yes. Uh, what, um, like I said, I have spoken to RFK and he is, he's well aware of the real problem. Even the Wall Street Journal back in 2010 put it on the front page. They call it the revolving door. How do these um, pharmaceutical companies, banks, etc., cetera, uh, deal? They never get charged with anything. It's because they hire the very people that are supposed to be regulating them and supervising them. So, you know, like I said, even you can Google it. It's called the revolving door. And um, RFK is well aware of that. You know, his organization, I've spoken to people and, you know, they're, this is what the deep state is so afraid of. Uh, this is why they're afraid of, of Trump, because the first time they picked his cabinet, all right, they stuffed it with all these neocons and everyone was stabbing him in the back. And the press was saying, oh, he's a hard man to work with. No, a lie. All right. This time, notice what he's doing. He's picking everybody before he even gets in there. It's All beautiful. Right? He knows it's the great. game now. Yeah, that's their uh, that's their greatest fear. And and you know, uh, some people on Fox News and and them they were saying, well, you know, like we're a bit we're a bit shocked at he's snubbing Pompeo, but I remember Pompeo in this last four years saying some very negative things about Trump right on Fox News. And I thought, what a what a horrible, like, he's a turncoat, you know, and I, I didn't like him at all. So it doesn't surprise me that Trump's got a good memory. This last four years revealed all of the, the true blues and, you know, true to him and the traitors. Well, Pompey, he's, he's a neocon. He always wants war as well. Um, John, you know, Bolton, uh, you know... <clears throat> He even Trump said he wanted to start World War Three over the fact that Iran, you know, shot down an, an unmanned drone. <laughs> um, Crazy. It's, I don't know what's what's wrong with these people. I mean, Nikki Haley, the same thing. I think she was out actually said uh, that um, <clears throat> uh, that Hamas invaded, you know, Ukraine. Oh, that was a present for for Putin because it was on his birthday. I mean. Um, I mean, it, it's just complete insanity and all this stuff. And, and why they always want war. I mean, they just hate people. I mean, if anybody else, if you'd started doing something like that, they call it a hate crime. Right. I mean, they're putting people in prison, even like 12-year-old kids in, in Britain because they criticize the government. Mm. Uh, I mean... This is, it's going nuts. They gave one guy 20 months in prison because he said he's sick and tired of his taxes going to uh, illegal migrants that rape our kids. I mean, wow. I have friends in Germany with a 13 year old girl will not even allow them to walk to the bus stop anymore. Um, it's, you know. And why is that? Is that the migrant issue? Is, is that that it's just yeah. become dangerous? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a growing <laughs> issue that, uh, we're finally starting even in Canada, even our very liberal Trudeau is basically saying, oh, OK, we realize we've got a problem. We've let in an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like three million in the last three years. And and we've got a growing crime problem. We have a growing, you know, mm -hmm. difficulty with housing, economy, everything. But the, the, the U.S., it's been on steroids for that. And Look, it, um, it's harmful. I I. Being in Florida, I know a lot of Mexicans who are here legally. They were upset with it because they said I had to learn the language. I had to have a skill. Same thing. Arguments were, you know, why Brexit won. Most of the Indian community there were medical. Um, they had to learn to speak the language and show that they had a valid career that made it worthwhile letting them in. And then you just let all these people in they have no they don't speak the language um 
what skills do they have? Uh, you know, a lot of them are you know, the best that you can possibly hope for is is a laborer. That's about it. Uh, it. You know, you don't just let people in. And and I can tell you that you know, back in '97, I had the uh, mandate from Hong Kong. They wanted me to negotiate with the Australian government, and I met with the prime minister uh, back then, Paul Keating. Uh, and well, he was a treasurer at the time, and he, then he became, you know, the prime minister. Uh, and everything I proposed, I said, "Look, I'm authorized to pay off your national debt. What's the problem? I won't won't sell me, sell me an island. Won't allow them in." And he said, <clears throat> "I asked him. I said, is this racist? You just don't like Chinese?" It's the only thing I could come up with. And he said, no. He says, they are fleeing communism. And if they come here, they would vote conservative. And he was a labor government. So <clears throat> that was the first time I encountered that. It had nothing to do with these people. Will they help the economy, hurt the economy? What are they bringing? None of that. It's like, who are they going to vote for? Right. Um, and and that's it's all down all to that. These- and, and I wonder yes, if the Democrats it. have maybe not understood, because I remember speaking on this two years ago. I'm like, but all these people that are coming from other parts of the world, they don't believe in transgenderism. They don't want their children to be taught this uh, gender fluid nonsense. Um, th- they actually don't ascribe to the values of the people that are bringing them in, hoping that they're going to stay Democrat. And uh, it, I mean, it's an interesting twist in everything. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... In Europe, it's it's a bit worse because most of them were um, Muslim and they have a different religion and a different culture. Yes, and that's and that's a growing concern. And I'd love you to weigh in on that because here in Canada, we're seeing unprecedented anti-Semitism. They are burning the Canadian flag, and they're saying now they're not just saying you know long live Hamas. They're saying death to Canada and Hamas is coming. And I think that's very alarming for our Canadian country. Yeah, you, look, it's, you you can't. What's the purpose of allowing them in? I mean, everybody that yeah. came from Europe to North America, you know, back in in the nineteenth century, came here for an opportunity. They didn't get you know free welfare and and everything else. You came here and. Um, you know, as I told the EU, I said it was it was what made America great was discrimination. They said, oh, how could you say that? I, could, I said, because it was fair. Whoever was last off the boat, you know, got didn't get a job until they spoke English. You know, that was basically it. Yeah. Uh, once they did, then fine. Then the next generation all merged. So you ask, you ask somebody, you know, what are you? You say, oh, I'm half Irish, half German, whatever. You don't see that in Europe. Yeah. You know, you know, of course, there's some exceptions, but not much. Sure. Um, you know, one of the uh, the leaders of the People's Party here in Canada, he he advocated. He said, if we're bringing people in the Yazidis, uh, the the, uh, the the people that are persecuted for their Christianity, when you have a country like North America founded on Christian values, you know, the, the former leaders and whether we just embrace freedom now and and all of that what what we do love about christianity was the freedom what we do love is that we're not conquerors uh if anything we lay down we lay down uh you know the you know jesus said uh turn the cheek and maybe we're guilty of that too much because there is you know there is some uh plausible parts of scripture that would say when it's time to fight jesus even said i did not come for peace but came to bring a sword well, what did he mean by that? When Peter lopped off somebody's ear when they were trying to take Jesus to be crucified, Jesus turned around and said, no, like you will die by the sword if you do that. And he put the ear back on the soldier's head. And that must have been quite a day for the soldier, I'd have to say. I'd like to hear his words on that one day. But but the, the thing is, is that we have a country that embraces freedom, but we should have the choice of who comes in and that they would maybe have... We have lots of uh, Christians being persecuted across the world. Bring them all in. They'd probably work hard. They'd embrace Christian values. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be bringing a, a completely separate ideology of of honoring Hamas and Hezbollah on our own land. Yeah, and look, in Sweden, they, 
they they posted signs Shira Law here. You're not assimilating, okay? Why are you going there? Um, just for money? That's it. But you want to keep your own culture? I mean, you you know, people came here to get away from everything that was in Europe. Um, it was a, a, an interesting documentary on FDR, and he went to Boston trying to, to argue to to get into World War II. And they were all, you know, mostly Irish there. And they said, you got to be kidding. We should go over there and, and defend Britain after what they did to us. No way. <laughs> you know? um, so <clears throat> that's why America was always isolationist and, until Pearl Harbor. I mean, we would not get into these wars. And uh, they always needed something, some excuse uh, to get to, to join the, you know, the fray. But um you know, we, we have to understand that, you know, allowing people in, they have to have some sort of talent. They want to basically uh, assimilate into the culture of the country they're coming to. Uh, if, if they're just trying to bring what they have over here, then why, you, you know, go back. I mean, I can tell you in Germany, you know, they had people fleeing supposedly uh, from Syria and different places. And then the government paid them for a two week vacation to return from the very place that they said that they're fleeing. And the government paid for vacations for that. Uh, I mean, it's like, hello. I mean, who is running this show here? I mean, is, does anybody have a common sense in their brain? No um, common sense. And maybe they were blinded by what you were talking about that you discovered. This is really political. And you think that if you help people to get in, they're going to be loyal to you. But people get wisened up pretty fast when they come even from a different country. Um, I mean, the worst part is that they're letting in the criminals and the people that came out of insane asylums from different parts of the world are now mm -hmm. our problem uh, in the US. But, um, but a, a lot of people, when they come here, like they don't want transgender people to get surgeries in prison like Kamala Harris was talking about. They don't want their kids indoctrinated. So this is just, you know, th these people don't even receive what's going on with the Democrat Party. So it's almost like it's falling. You were saying something about it splitting. So how, how would it split? What would that look like? In, in the United States, you'll see probably it is split up to about uh, three different sections, most likely. Northeast, West Coast. And the South in the middle, um, you know, Bible Belt, they're just simply different cultures. Uh, and, um, you know, what California wants is, is, is offensive to, to the Bible Belt. I mean, and then you can say, well, you can't have your religion. You have to adopt ours, mm -hmm. uh, which is not. I mean, it's, um, it's Canada strange. will, will Yeah, go, it's strange you know, that, that California's... West has done that. I saw that. I'm so sorry to, to uh, interrupt you. We just have a time delay here. But um, is um, I'm seeing that people like Donald Trump is saying that we need to make America pray again. That was one of his things that I just saw. He wants to bring the Bible back. He wants people to mm -hmm. celebrate Christianity. And he's making no bones about it. This is something that's really new. And so there is a movement to bring prayer back to school again because we were founded on that. And I guess I would say, like, prayer has not harmed anyone, even if you're an atheist. Like, it's not a bad thing if there's a bit of faith in your kid's life, or even if you're of a different culture. But let's understand that Muslims, they are, they are radical. Uh, they, they believe in the power of prayer. And it's sad when they, they become so, um, you know, given to their religious faith, that it puts us to shame because we won't stand up for anything. And I don't appreciate that at all. Like, like Muslims have been known to get up and start praying at a certain time in an airplane, right? To, you mm -hmm. know, everybody can't get past them and, you know, disrupting the plane, or they just start praying in the streets all at the same time, you know, to make a, to make a big spectacle of it all. And that's freedom. They get to do that, I guess. But here, you know, we're afraid to just maybe have a prayer. And my, my mom would uh, tell me about a time in Canada when they would say the Lord's Prayer every morning, 
you know, and there was a lot less crime. There was a lot less thing. People had a sense that there was a moral reason to be a good person, that maybe there was a God who might be monitoring what's going on in the world. I don't know. What's your take on all that? It's, and I mean, even in Islam, um, you know, there are different sects, etc. I mean, I've been to Turkey and on page three in the newspaper, there's a girl in a, in a bikini, you know, uh, you, you go over to, uh, I ran no possible way. Um, and Islam, you know, and you have extreming and, and Christianity and Jewish too. Uh, so you have different, you know, flavors of each religion, no matter what you're looking at. But, um, uh, you know, we just have to respect everybody in that, in that sense. Uh, Absolutely. And- but there seems to be the least amount of respect for Christianity these days. I really loved though, that the other, the other night at, uh, you know, where they do the big WEF and, and uh, Trump ended up there, that there was this gentleman that just gave all glory. People are starting to be very, uh, you know, courageous about expressing their faith in a very brief way. You know, I, I honor the Lord Jesus Christ, he said in his life in front of Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, th- this is a wonderful thing and it's a free country and people should be able to express their, their faith. Um, as they see it, but um, but Christians are also the ones under the Democrats that these parents that showed up at schools uh, to contest that this pornographic LGBTQ nonsense was being put in front of their children that they they weaponized you know the um, you know I don't know it was the FBI that was going after them and calling them mm-hmm. domestic terrorists like we've seen some pretty horrible days in the U.S. Yes, this is the problem you get into. Look, John Stuart Mill <clears throat> wrote a book on liberty. Read it. He even said in there, we have yet to free ourselves from the stain of legal persecution. Mm. The, the king used the law to persecute people, just as Biden was using it against Trump. And, um, you know, <clears throat> the reason in part that the Democrats are so befuddled. They thought everything they did to Trump, who would vote for a felon? And and that was just what, you know, didn't matter if it's legitimate or not. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, You know, you had a judge in New York said, oh, well, it's fraud. You valued your uh, Mar a Largo. I think it's only worth 18 million. Well, I'd buy it for 18 million, you know. Uh, I think I could flip it and double my money, you know, but it's, uh, this is just what's going on. They have used it. um, They've used the law against Trump in particular. And I think that has backfired more than anything, because you, you have people beginning to realize that this is, you know, this is just out of control at this point. Um, you, You know, it's, and what, I, what do you think about this uh, Matt, Gates, uh, Matt Gates appointment? Um, he sure is tough and he asks good questions and he's been quite a, a drill sergeant uh, for what's right. But he's it's it's been a pretty um, interesting sort of controversial appointment right now. Um, I, I like him. I like how tough he is. Um, I'm hoping there's nothing uh, that they're going to, you know, bring up no, on him. Look. It's, it's, um, he is going after politicians who <clears throat> bought stocks two days before, you know, uh, the Ukrainian invasion. You know, I mean, look, everybody knew, I mean, my computer, that's how I learned how the computer was, was able to forecast war. It was looking at, at capital flows. We had, a a client in uh, uh, in Lebanon, and they had called and asked if we could create a model in the Lebanese pan. I said, sure. We put it into the computer, and I thought there was something wrong with the data. I said, look, it says your country is going to fall apart in eight days. I don't understand what's it's got to be something wrong. And very quietly, they said, well, what currency does it recommend? Um, I said, Swiss franc. And we had another client from Saudi Arabia call and said, DG, what do you think gold's going to do? I, Iraq's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf tomorrow. I said, you tell me a war's going to start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 
somebody always knows the defense stocks started rising several days in advance of, of the Hamas attack. Um, you know, whoever knows that they're going to do a war, they move their money one way or another in advance. They always do. Wow. Um, it's so interesting the way that you've been able to be in on all of that. Um, with RFK and him wanting to make America healthy again, this seems like a positive thing. I mean, how does how does CNN and MSNBC even really go against this? I see that they're also talking about they're pretty alarmed by he. I mean, he's starting to tell us what's in our kids cereals that's actually banned in other countries. Uh, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you do you think that um, he's ready for for it all, the good, the bad, the ugly of getting into politics this way? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> look, he's been attacked. Fake news has attacked him uh, his whole life. Um, so he's been called anti-Semitic to just about every, other, every name in the book. Um, <clears throat> he, he does have a thick skin and, and, <clears throat> um, he's, you know, he's going to give it a good shot and he knows the game. Uh, you know, his children's defense fund has been fighting, um, the agencies for a long time. Uh, the, the problem I, the reason I suggested that he should join Trump was I knew back in 2016, Trump offered him a commission to on vaccines to start it. <clears throat> what happened? Pfizer and the rest of them, they started threatening to withdraw money from everybody else unless that thing was shut down. Um, it was shut down <clears throat> uh, about three months before the COVID vaccine. Uh, you know, look, so I know a lot of the background. So I knew there, the two of them met in, in Trump tower back then. I knew what happened, um, from other sources. And that's why I, I told them, look, I mean, go with Trump, please. <laughs> you know, at least the two of you are, are anti-war. Uh, and that's really what made the deal. I mean, he understood yeah. that, but I also knew that Trump was well aware of the deep state and that's how that's the problem people are now going to see just how deep the deep state really is yes um it's you it's know i got to be... i got to ask trump that question um i was in i uh, happened to be in a room a smaller room uh with him about uh two years ago i'm going to say now and um <clears throat> i had to pay to get there i wasn't a friend or anything um and um and I said to him, sir, uh, the, the deep state, like you said, you know, that you'd clean the swamp. And he looked and he had just such a sad, deep, but profound look on his face. And he says, ah, yes, that swamp, much deeper than we thought it was. He says, we'll go mm -hmm. after it next time. And the, the whole room applauded all of that. But I think those were very true words. He didn't know last time. What, what he was up against. Now, no, like you did. say, he's appointing all of his own people. RFK knows who the deep state is. Trump knows at least a measure of, of uh, who to avoid and what they have to deal with. Well, I, I can tell you because I used to be part of the vetting process for people who wanted to be president. They would send me in and I would meet with them, uh, you know, back in the days from Ross Perot and the governor of Oklahoma and all that. Um, <clears throat> And it was the, back then it was more or less, what do you think? Are they smart enough? Can they handle it? Uh, then I was asked to go meet with Bush Jr. I said, yeah, okay, fine. And they said, oh, this one's different. I said, what's different? They said, oh, no, he's, he's really stupid. I said, excuse me? Uh, and I said, why would you make somebody stupid president? And they said, well, he's got the name so we can win. They then picked his cabinet. They picked Dick Cheney. They picked everybody. I was asked if I would take this, the chief economic advisor. I said, no, I'm not going to give up my company for, for this. Um, and look, I mean, you don't see Bush Jr. out giving a lot of speeches. You know, Obama, you do. All right. Not Bush Jr. Mm. Uh, it, it's they picked that cabinet. I was there. I knew how this works. All right. Um, 
That's why Trump is doing it now before he even gets to Washington. He understands the game. As I've said, it exists. And I've warned them about it. And he's now picking all his own people ahead of time. What I find interesting is even Joe Rogan uh, recently commented on his loss of respect for Obama. And I couldn't believe the mistakes Obama was making, like he was chastising the African-American men for, you know, you're misogynist, you're not voting for Kamala. Like, I feel like Obama in general has brought his, uh, you know, cachet uh, way down after his behavior and even his wife's. Yes. Um, look, it, this is all about just politics. That's it. Um, it. They have no respect for the people below. They really do not. Um, Obama was was basically sending up his people to interfere in your elections uh, to make sure Trudeau won. I mean, I've been in 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 London when uh, Carville was sent over by Clinton to help you know, basically Tony Blair win. They're always interfering in elections globally to, to push this same agenda. And um, the audacity of, of like blaming, oh, Putin interfered, you know. Look, Russia doesn't interfere in everybody's elections as the, wet, as the left does here. Uh, and every country that I've been to, they're there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I I just, you know, I hope that we can just see the end of people interfering, um, you know, for their own agendas, especially stupid agendas. I hope that that does end and that we see um, this common sense put back. Before we let you go, you did mention that you thought the recession was going to be around. Can you give people your best advice for how to navigate economically the next few years? Um, unfortunately, these people are going to do everything they can to try and, uh, prevent Trump from accomplishing anything. Uh, the neocons have, uh, NATO in their back pocket. I mean, that's really become a retirement home for neocons and they're pushing for war over there. Uh, NATO was even out trying to raise a hundred billion dollars. They, uh, to keep the war against Russia going if Trump came to power. Uh, they just want war. That's it. They think that, you know, you know. <clears throat> look, Zelensky's not defending the Donbass. He invades Russia. Why? Because they've been trying to get Russia to attack anything in NATO so they can call him the aggressor. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, but, you know, now, okay, fine. Give long-range missiles Destroy Moscow if you can. That will force him out. This is, you know, look, Zelensky is our Hezbollah, basically, right? Hezbollah is the proxy for Iran. He, you know, Zelensky is just a proxy for us. That's it. Um, there was a peace deal. And, you know, he's had the audacity, oh, well, I invaded Russia to force him into a peace deal. They had a peace deal. Boris Johnson from Britain hopped on the plane, said, you're not allowed to have peace and killed it. Over a million Ukrainians are now dead since then. I mean, this is wow. all propaganda. Whatever they say is a lie. You know, this is it. You, you can also look on Face the Nation. You can Google that up. Lindsey Graham, another neocon, uh, basically came out and he told the truth for once. He said, oh, there's 10 to $12 trillion in natural resources under Crimea. It's a gas field. We can't allow Russia and China to get that. Oh, so I thought this was supposed to be about democracy and everything, you know. It's, wow. it's about assets all the time. You know, um, Just he said that back. right on Face the Nation. Wow. It just, it, maybe he... Maybe he would think later, ah, maybe he shouldn't have said that. Totally revealed yeah, I mean, his hand. Like, it, it, look, this is what they do all the time. Um, you know, Dick Cheney's, you know, <clears throat> endorsed Camilla. Why? For war. He's the one that took us into Iraq. 
I mean, I don't get these people. They just always, always want war. Yeah. That's it. They, they, they were never on the battlefield. They don't care how many people die. Uh, they really don't care. I mean, you, you just had Zelensky sending in, you know, and bombing an apartment building, killing even children. There's just, they're not, it's not a military t target. And this is what I Civilians guess got, always. that's right. And, and, you know, Trump basically was saying this, you know, about, was it, was it Liz Cheney? He was saying, well, like, let's line her up in front of bullets or whatever and see how she likes, she, she see if she's so yeah. willing to, you know, go to war or send, send our sons to war, our sons and daughters to war. Um, he, he was making that point that these people um, don't seem to understand this. This is very personal. Uh, we lose they don't care. Our, our family. They don't care. It's so true what you're saying. So true. They really don't care. Yeah. Um, as you know, I've, I've dealt with many governments. Trump saying he was upset by sending letters because he has to send a letter to every soldier that dies to their family. And he's the only one that ever took that personal. Everybody else is like collateral damage. Whether or not they even sign them, probably somebody else does. Uh, look at Pfizer. They know somebody dies from every vaccine. All right. So instead of doing anything legitimate, they don't take responsibility and they want the, the, the politicians to give them absolute immunity so nobody can sue them. I yes. mean, if you bought a car from General Motors and one out of 100 blows up when you stick the key in and you turn it, and you can't sue them, you know, something's wrong. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, something's wrong. They don't deserve absolute immunity. And the yeah. fact that they even ask for it proves that there's something wrong. Mm. Mr. Armstrong, you you've been so right. Yeah, you're right. Um, you've been so gracious with your time. I just thank you so very much. Uh, we love hearing from you. Our audience loves you. And uh, we appreciate that uh, you're giving us insight and the truth. Please give RFK our love from Canada and any dealings you have with all of them. We are 100% um, in favor of what is happening. And we're celebrating as Canadians, many of us, thousands and thousands, millions are celebrating what's going on there because we're hoping that the residue is going to come, you know, then onto us. And we need it. We don't really see that big miracle in front of us right now it's, so it's hard it's coming okay that's good news <laughs> that's a great place to end thank you mr armstrong god bless you and we'll talk to you again thank you god bless you and thank you for inviting me thank you very nice very nice i like him uh it's always interesting to talk around all of the topics that are going on i want to uh play you just this clip uh, rep Nancy Mace saying why she will not share a bathroom with newly elected congressperson McBride inside the Capitol take a look but that being a feminist makes me ex an extremist I'm totally here for it is this effort in response to Congresswoman McBride coming to Congress yes and absolutely and then some I'm not gonna stand for a man, uh, you know, someone with a penis is in the women's locker room, that's not okay. And I'm a victim of abuse myself. I'm a rape survivor. I have PTSD from the abuse I've suffered at the hands of a man. And I know how vulnerable women and girls are in private spaces. So I'm absolutely 100% gonna stand in the way of any man who wants to be in a women's restroom, in our locker rooms, in our changing rooms. I will be there fighting you every step of the way. Wow. Interesting days. And I love her courage to just speak the truth. Um, I don't want myself, my daughter, uh, my loved ones to be in a bathroom with a, a dude who, uh, you know, seems to think that he's somehow a female because he can just proclaim that it's a crazy time that we're living in. But I see, I see change. And, you know, when AOC is taking her pronouns down, Lots of people across the country taking their pronouns down. Everybody's getting a little bit wiser about all of this stuff. And, and it's not wiser. They always knew it was dumb. Uh, but they're getting more courageous to be able to speak out. And I knew this day would come. I'm glad to see it coming. 
we need we still have a lot of work to do here in Canada because they're still running all over us with nonsense you know with boys being in girls sports and going in our bathrooms and you know just these laws uh, if you basically say anything against this at your job if you in Canada if you spoke like this lady at a job where you're at where you've got uh, some guy saying he's a woman and going into the women's bath you're the one who would get fired not him no you know um, well, we, we have a lot of work to do, but I think that it'll get done as we are courageous. Um, let's look at Good Morning America report that explains how they are modifying the weather. This is fascinating. There are currently 42 cloud seeding projects across the American West, like this one in Utah, where they take planes like this with flares attached. They fly right into the storm and send microscopic particles into the cloud. Particles that act like magnets for water droplets, bonding together until they are heavy enough to fall to the ground as rain or snow. At the University of Colorado, researchers are working on artificial intelligence to deploy cloud seeding drones. And it's not just cloud seeding from the sky. There are hundreds of those things. That shack you see in the foreground is a ground-based cloud seeder. The little flame coming out is sending tiny silver iodide particles up into the sky. When a storm comes through, they go up to 2,000 feet above our head, into the storm, up those mountains, and make more snow than it naturally would. While cloud seeding has been helping get every last drop out of some of the driest years on record, this past winter, Mother Nature came through. The Southern Rockies, which feed the Colorado River, got more than four times their average snow. But experts say it's still not enough. As much as cloud seeding is a boost or a help, it's not a solution. The main solution is conservation. Wow, isn't that amazing? Um, you know, what they are doing. And we know that they've been doing it all over. I'll never forget years and years ago, I think um, 2019, um, when someone was explaining in Alberta all of the changes in the, you know, this, you know, they'd come and spray these, these air, airplanes would fly over and they would spray and leave this, you know, residue for hours and hours. And people find things in their uh, dog and cat, um, dog and cat bowls outside. Like there's just so many toxins in the air. What are they doing? And for a while, it was kind of like such a conspiracy theory, but it's not that anymore. Uh, people know what's happening. There are laws even in between the U.S. and Canada about how close to the borders they can do their weather modification. So this is a real thing. This is really happening. And uh, mankind is changing. So some very strange things going on. One more, and this is about the explanation on the absurdity of having large electric trucks. Take a look. Just so we're clear on the scale of the issue, each electric vehicle battery for a heavy-duty truck weighs 8,000 pounds, and you need at least two of them. So we're talking the weight of, you know, four or five cars. And our, my friends and peers in the industry nationwide who have tried to make efforts to put in, say, hey, I'm going to convert a dozen forklifts to electric, or I want to tee up a facility for 30 electric trucks. There's no power. The utilities come back, the cities come back and say, is this some kind of joke? One friend tried to put in, in Illinois, a, uh, a facility, tee it up for 30 trucks electrification. The city came back and said, this is some kind of joke. You're asking for more draw than the entire city requires. And just to give you an idea, 30, 50 trucks, that's like a five, six megawatt application. The factory that makes the trucks is a two megawatt factory. Well, I'm glad that they're going to have to figure it out because it makes no sense to me. But who am I? All right. So if any of you would like to get some silver and gold, uh, Mr. Armstrong, one of the things that he has supported over the years is gold and silver. We highly recommend you understand that there's a, a fiat cash problem and uh, I'm sure that there's going to be some remedies coming from the United States on certain things but we just cannot trust what they are doing so get some silver and gold um, on a day when your cash suddenly becomes worthless like monopoly money silver and gold will not be the problem okay fiat currency will be but silver and gold would, would have been a safe place to have put your funds all right, uh, for ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, if you would like your own stash, please make sure that you contact uh, Mia at sozohealth at proton.me. 
Mia at SozoHealth at Proton.me. We also want to continue to advocate for uh, getting some Laetrile or vitamin B17 into your system. Uh, has had tremendous, tremendous results helping people uh, with all of these things that we're now facing with cancers and whatnot. So make sure that you go to RNC store and also see our um, our interview with um, John Richardson on this whole issue. And that is, of course, and anything that uh, you don't catch, it's always stored on Rumble. And uh, my dog's having a little coughing fit, so I'm just going to try not to look at her so she just doesn't think she's getting attention, you know? It's so funny how they are. Oh, my goodness. All right. So, oh, it's been a day, hasn't it? I really appreciate Mr. Armstrong for some of the things um, that he has uh, enlightened us on over the years. He has been extremely correct on judging what would happen uh, in the future and how he was able to predict market collapses at certain times. He just, he really follows things and he seems to have a certain gifting from God, I would say, on those kind of things. So I want to, I want to thank very much all of you who support what we do. You send wonderful letters. You send kind notes about uh, the different shows that you've watched. We honestly don't have words adequate enough to thank you because without you, we just couldn't do it. It's you and us together to reap a harvest. Our website is laurelin.tv and you can see right there, there's a donate button and you can donate anonymously. You can donate one, one time only or you can become a monthly partner. And if you become a monthly partner, um, we would love if, if you can do $50 or more, we're going to send you my book and we're going to send you this beautiful little necklace. Uh, it's absolutely lovely and it has a cross and you know that I, I love to wear crosses because I think it represents my Lord and Savior and it lets people know what I believe and I like that. So if you're able to help us um, one time become a monthly partner or an anonymous donation, it's wonderful. You can also e-transfer us at LLTTLive at pm.me or laurelinlive at gmail.com. Some people like that one better. I don't know. It's easier. laurelinlive at, at gmail.com. 1-800-437-4356. That's where you can also get a hold of us. And we have a P.O. Box number for those of you who like snail mail. Uh, as long as there's not a postal strike, we're, we're going to be, uh, you know, hindered somewhat here and there. But box 1065, Vetter Crossing, Chilliwack, B.C., V2R3N7. Thank you. We, we bless you. We appreciate you so much. I want to leave you today with Romans 8 and uh, verse 35. I love this. I, I have my little pink Bible that I keep and I mark it up for my daughter so that one day I'll leave it for her. And in Romans 8, 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? All of these things that we fear, nuclear war, wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, what will separate us from the love of God? Do you think that if any of those things happen that God is not with us, that he is not watching. Absolutely, he's with us. And we do not need to fear. Fear mongers are the same as war mongers. And the fear mongers are out there wanting us to be afraid of all of these different things that we hear going on. Do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of the bird flu and uh, the monkey pox. You just have to trust God. And it says, what will separate us? And the word says, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Jesus himself said that I, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And yet the great shepherd is the one who protects the sheep. So we don't have to worry about those wolves out there who have ill gotten agendas against us. We don't have to fear all of that, no. What shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing, nothing. You are His. 
He is yours. He will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. He will also be with you on the mountaintops when it looks a whole lot better. I like those days, but it does seem that increasingly we have, we have evil to face and it's a spiritual battle. It's the war of all wars and it won't end until our time here on earth has ended, but we have this assurity that we have him. So we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but the word in verse 37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Some biblical references say, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing will separate you. And I don't know what you're facing. You know, it's not just world issues that we're concerned about. We're concerned about our families. Some of us have divisions in our families and it's heartbreaking. And you're going through a season where Perhaps children, um, you know, are not speaking to you. Perhaps there's been some sort of separation in your family and it's breaking you and it, it hurts so much. Perhaps your marriage is going through a difficult season and you need a God-sized intervention. Well, what will separate us from God? Will any of these divisions, will any of these pains and earthly trials separate us from God? No. He is with you in the darkest moments of your life. He is right there. And for any of you that are maybe struggling with some things going on, remember this. He is always, always only one prayer away. If you need to make that prayer, make it right now. God bless everyone. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing. But for some of us, we feel that we have no choice. Because if we are silent about these abominations, things then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that for those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement I am deeply grateful thank you for all the letters that you've been sending thank you for the donations and the support I found out that in order to speak the truth you have to become very very strong if you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me remember my friends all is well all is well. Thanks for joining me.